Hi, hi everyone. Um, I'm Marian. I'm French. I live in Tibet since 20 years and I studied in Darjeeling for four years. Um, I'd like to share first on personal level how my action emerged from deep down aspirations when all my internal parts function as a collective system aligned in one direction. And it creates a great deal of drive. And the second part of my presentation will be focusing more on my nature connection, more in a conceptual level. Uh, a, little bit, a little bit about my background that explains how I got driven from age 16 after I spent time in Calcutta working in mobile clinics with Dr. Jack Prager. He is the one who invented the street medicine, uh, offering with a group of Indian doctors medical care free of charge to people living in the most challenging slums. Uh, I stayed in touch with these raw realities of extreme conditions of life. Um, and I started to um, seek for a way how to strengthen my motivation uh, to be at service. And I wanted to contribute to alleviate suffering. So that was my main driver. And when I was uh, 18 years old, I got emerged in, at the root of the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in the monastery uh, near Darjeeling in a small village called Mirik, where I spent four years. I arrived in Lhasa when I was 22 years old because my teacher, Bukha Rinpoche, was a Tibetan nomad from Western Tibet, and he was fully um, committed to bring support towards uh, indigenous nomads uh, through education program in his native um, Western Tibet area. But he couldn't go back himself to Tibet. So I became a kind of a messenger or a vehicle in action to realize his wish. And he passed away two years later after I arrived in Tibet. However, I, I stayed there for 20 years working on this project uh, with a small organization uh, called Highland Initiatives. So you have the link um, below this presentation. And with this organization, we have facilitated about 50 projects and large and small scale project on the Tibetan plateau, mainly related to education, ecology, and culture. So this part of my life is foundational as it created um, a framework within myself and closed with spiritual, spiritual values and practices. And my goal was to cultivate and sustain an altruistic orientation. So my spiritual and contemplative commitments became aligned with compassion in action or in the service of practical causes, consistent with my values. As I was working with the Tibetans uh, on, on the Tibetan high plateau with nomads, initiating social projects, um, I actually didn't have any remuneration. So I needed to sustain myself in another way. And I became a mountain Himalayan mountain guide and developed a platform of Tibetan responsible entrepreneurs um, working in the field of trekking and guiding in Tibet. So the company I founded is a Global Nomad and it promotes social entrepreneurships. In 2012, uh, I got involved in a very special project with the, um, the company, the Tibetan owned company, Tibet Himalaya Expedition, uh, organizing expeditions on Mount Everest on the Tibetan side. I, I got involved in cleaning up the Mount Everest in the North Face with students of a Tibet uh, Lhasa Mountain Guide School, where I was a teacher uh, all about social entrepreneurship and ecology. And in four years, uh, with Clean Everest expeditions, we have collected 
10 tons of trash on the north face of Everest in Tibet. The Clean Everest expeditions actually allowed us to set up a waste management model with, with 60 local trained guides in the, in the field and with the support of the local uh, government who sent yaks, a uh, round of yaks, like every two weeks we had like 50 yaks uh, coming at 6,500 meters who carried down tons of trash. And to put in place the mountain uh, cleanup uh, charter for mountaineers and to set an example, I personally went to the summit three times. So the, the clean Everest intervention serves as a model to keep Himalayan glaciers water pure. So now that glacier protection is being handled, uh, luckily we are fully dedicated to the a new project, which actually is the, the reason why I'm in Tibet, is the, the education uh, program for nomad. And uh, the, the project is the Nomad Institute project to help nomads protect the environment of the Tibetan plateau. So the Nomad Institute project is a place to study the nomad way of life because this philosophy is fitting the young generation aspirations and it can help us write a better future. The Nomad Institute project means to link and adapt the nomads ancient knowledge to our modern society's needs. So it connects very well with our question, how do we act in an uncertain world? And actually the, the groundwork for what I'm sharing now is based on knowledge of Dropa, who are the Tibetan nomads. They have made community decisions that influence the way of all households survive. They have demonstrated an ability to rapidly respond to market forces through the focusing on of production, diversification, and making use of increased in opportunities to invest resources and improve household incomes. So this knowledge is not simply concerned with opportunities uh, for economic success, no, but it shows a uh, more like an innate understanding that the dropper know how to survive. And this knowledge is concerned with how to survive as a culture. Alongside using the skills and knowledge that may have economic value in changing circumstances. Tashidochi Hashi was born into a nomad family on the Tibetan plateau. He grew up within the traditional Dropatong community and structure. And Dropa stands for nomad, and Tsang is the name for family. In the Tibetan culture, Dropa Tsang provides shelter to all living creatures and protects pastures, springs, mountains, rivers, and lakes. During his childhood, Tashi Doji um, witnesses the growing influence of the dominant industrial culture on the Tibetan way of life. Profit only oriented business practices have entered the real nomadic life, favoring individual businesses, consideration over social and ecological cohabitation. Traditional practices and knowledge are regarded as backward. Effectively marginalizing the Tibetan nomadic civilization. So Tashi Doji followed this new trend and left his community to pursue higher education in mainland China. Here he was exposed to the global dynamics of ecology, economy, and culture. He learned about the potential and the pitfalls of capitalist practices. He came to understand how the ecological and moral values of the Dropatsan provide concrete solution to the Tibetan plateaus environmental problems. So Tashi Doji returned to his birthplace to realize his vision. It is a forward-looking vision which marries traditional practices with scientifically informed knowledge. He says, we need a new mode of civilization, 
as it is increasingly proposed and welcomed by people around the world to lead us towards a better tomorrow. For that, we need to revive our Tibetan nomadic civilization in which lies the eco awareness and bring our Drokatsang back. So the Nomad Institute program here is about bringing back Drokatsang, but it is also about redefining it. It is about creating harmony between men and nature. So the project goal is to restore and preserve the ecosystem of the Tibetan plateau. To achieve this project aims to establish a modern cohabitation between men and nature. The Tibetan nomads are the key beneficiaries. They are key to the creation and protection of the ecological balance that the project aims for. Concrete program activities are divided into three distinct but mutually reinforcing core projects. Nomadic communities that wish to lead the way and in any in innovation become role model camps. The Nomad Institute in Detroit, in Yushu, is the place where dialogue takes place, where knowledge is shared, where good practices are disseminated. Here, the vision as a contemporary drug pet song is discussed. It's for nomads to continue their nomadic way of life, they need to diversify their income opportunities. And the project develops two business ideas. One, ecotourism. The nomadic setting is ideal for to, to welcome tourists and promote the sustainable use of natural resources. Uh, but we have to do it in a very, very caring way. Retail, uh, 30 zero waste shops will promote environmentally friendly products and help nomads to reduce their household waste. So those shops are selling products made by the nomad and for the nomad. While the project headquarters is located at the, at the Nomad Institute in Dutro, project activity will also take part in Qinghai, but also in Sichuan and Gansu provinces and in Tibet autonomous region. The project reached out to 160,000 direct beneficiaries and indirectly benefits a further 1.6 million nomads. Second part of my presentation relates on how dismantling wrong views about the world and that can be a powerful approach to action in an uncertain world. So some marginalized populations such as the Drogba usually hold a different type of knowledge and perceive the world in a different way. They hold a less orthodox vision of human history, world geography, and the dualistic perception that separates man and nature. These different perspectives challenges, challenge or certain and fixed reality, observing the complexity of our systems, systemic challenges become more and more tangible. This ever-changing world is evolving faster and faster. To connect in depth with the unbalanced situation we are falling into and to remain still with that is an important practice. In the same way, the Drogba develop an innate understanding that know how to survive, but that they face challenging situations all the time. Dwelling in uncertainty is their natural state of being. Autonomy, self-determination and adaptability is their response and it makes them grow continuously in that caring strength. Now, our modern civilization remains stuck in a fixed and certain view of, on the world. It cannot get to the stage of instinctively knowing the path to survival because it is not getting in touch with the reality of our vulnerability. Nature being what control the movement and drive of human history and not on the way around. We can also learn about the paradoxical self 
domestication of the human animal, about the demographic and epidemiological dynamics of the increasingly sedentary lifestyle, and about the logic of servitude and war in the ancient world. Human beings themselves might have been transformed by domestication, producing their own irre irreversible change and less aware of their surroundings. The needs of domesticated plants and animals almost make us slaves to their specific and daily needs. Another way to act in an uncertain world is by observing the natural boundaries made by ecosystems. In this way, humans can develop in harmony with nature and it will make us act with care because it simply makes sense to take care of nature which takes care of us. In Tibet, sacred geography always places lake lakes, mountains, springs, at the center of ge geographical world in which we live and at the center of the symbolic representation of the universe. Through, through sacred geography, we realize that nature and culture are inextricably linked. Another way to act in this world of uncertainty could be to start by creating a compassionate framework in which oral transmission, tip stories, and wisdom traditions can be spread throughout the world, using modern technologies to broadcast stories that illustrate interbeing and a sense of care for places. The way we design the world through stories, myths, and images become our cultural identity. The notion of cultural identity brings us to the idea of nation and state, and thus to politics. We could help politicians to connect with new stories and work at the state level for a top-down management that promotes the wisdom traditions and that help to erode arbitrary boundaries between natural and cultural resource management. If we nourish our imagination with local stories, deepening our understanding of interbeing, we make our action and more integrated in the land in which we live. We start caring so much more for the place where we are. Our self-centered behaviors start to dissolve, gathering folk narratives and broadcasting them on local social media is a great way to form a collective vision. So ecosystems define our perception of the world, such as forest, oceans, rivers, areas storing fresh water and frozen part of the ocean. Greenland and Antarctica's huge ice sheets hold roughly 75% of the world's fresh water. There is another, and it's often called the third pole. The third pole encompasses the snow-covered mountains surrounding the Tibetan plateau. This region is also called the Hindu Kush Himalaya region, including chains of mountains stretching across eight countries, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, China, India, Myanmar, Nepal, and Pakistan. A Tibetan poem from 8th century described it as such. The center of the sky, the score of the earth, this heart of the world sealed by snow, the promontory of all rivers where the mountains are high and the earth is pure. The Tibetan plateau is located at an average altitude of 4,000 meters and covered an area of 2.5 million square kilometers. It is home to threatened and endangered species. The 
Tibetan plateau is known as the third pole because the glaciers of Central and South Asia, including Tibet, all the largest reserves of glaciers outside of Antarctica, Greenland, and Canada. Ten of the largest rivers in Asia have their source here, including the Yellow River in China and the Ganga in India. Today, two million people depend on water from the Tibetan Plateau. However, the third pole is experiencing a temperature increase of 0.3 degree every 10 years. The Chinese Academy of Science even considers that the temperature of the plateau will increase by 4.6 degrees by the end of the century, three times faster than the average increase in global temperatures. As a result, the majority of Tibetan glaciers are melting. According to many Chinese scientists, if this trend continues, 40% of the Himalayan glaciers will disappear by 2050. Many problems arise from this. First, rapid glacial melt forms glacial lakes, which are unstable and prone to collapse, threatening the habitat of local population. In addition, the permafrost of the Tibetan plateau is melting, which is very problematic. Permafrost is a layer of frozen earth that holds water near the surface of the ground, providing moisture to grassland and vegetation above ground. Wetlands are threatened. Wetlands play an important role in water storage and biodiversity. Finally, the desertification due to wind erosion is getting worse every day. What is happening at the third pole is one of the great challenges of the, our time. Does the solution perhaps lie with the inhabitants of the third pole itself? Whether you are inhabitants of the third pole or inhabitants of Europe, the key elements for the reversing of the ecological degradation and reinventing wisdom tradition dwells in human minds. It functions with perception. So we focus on opening ourselves to a shift of perception. One of the worldviews largely shared among humans is that human beings are and nature are separated entities. This dualistic belief leads humans to dominate their surrounding and control nature as a world. Another way to act in this world is to put contemplative techniques, which erodes this separation at the center of our lives. In this way, we open up to a shift in perception. With the dissolution of the eye, a different perception of the environment opens up. With the notion of self-centeredness being dis diminished, we feel as if everything is opening up around us, inside ourselves. Perceptions and sensations shed light on things that we never explored inside ourselves. Relationship with the world of living being changed. We learn from all living things. New form of sharing with the environment develop. Such a symbiosis with the living world allows us to lay the foundations of a responsible and sensitive ecology.